Good evening and thank you for being here. We're going to get started in just a minute. We're giving everyone a chance to um, get into our room this evening and, um, and then we'll get started. Just a quick uh, note, we have Q&A box down below. So as we're going through this program, if you have any questions or comments that you would like to pose to our panelists, please feel free to um, put those in our Q&A box and we will get those to you. We're going to go ahead and get started with our program. As people come in, um, we'll just have them join us as we get underway. But I'm going to go ahead and start our introductions. And I want to thank you all for being here. So good evening and welcome to our SU Book Club series called Let's Talk About It. This semester, our series is dedicated to book titles that are focused on and around the science of sustainability. Today, our discussion will be over the book titled, But Story of More, How We Got to Climate Change and Where to Go From Here by Hope Jaron. We will be recording this session and it will be made available on our on-demand streaming site, as well as the others that were in this series. Throughout the conversation, as I mentioned before, please feel free to submit any questions or comments that you have into the Q&A, which is located at the bottom of your screen. I'm very pleased to introduce you today to our panel that is leading our discussion. First, we have Veronica Johnson. She is a Southwestern University Sustainability Coordinator. In her role, she provides support for student-led sustainability projects hosts the Georgetown Green Film Series, and implements environmentally friendly infrastructure and initiatives on campus. Veronica also serves as the co-chair of the Campus's Sustainability Committee, teaches sustainable business practices in Southwestern's Economics and Business Department, and serves as the Communications Co-Chair on the Texas Regional Alliance for Campus Sustainability Executive Committee. She earned a BA in Environmental Engineering from Rice University in 2016 and is currently pursuing an MBA in Sustainability from Bard College. Also joining us is Molly O'Hara Polarski, who earned a BA in Environmental Studies from French and French from Southwestern University in 2012 and a master's degree in Environmental Policy from Sciences Po Paris in 2015. Since 2019, Molly has been the Sustainability Manager at SICA, a global specialty chemicals company with a leading position in the business sector and mo motor vehicle industry. There, she has had the opportunity to manage the sustainability program that she has built across North and South America. With a current focus on climate performance, renewable electricity, and product sustainability, Molly is navigating the company towards achieving its sustainability targets, as well as adopting a culture of environmental stewardship. And lastly, we have Charlie Stern. He's a nationally recognized expert in water resource policy, in particular issues related to the U.S. Bureau of Reclamation's activities in the Western United States. For the past 11 years, he has been a specialist in natural resources policy for the Congressional Research Service, or CRS, the nonpartisan policy research arm of the U.S. Library of Congress. Prior to joining CRS, Charlie was a program examiner in the interior branch of the White House Office of Management and Budget, or OMB, where he covered budget and policy issues related to the U.S. Geological Survey, the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, and the National Park Service, among other, other federal agencies. Charlie received his BA in History and Political Science from Southwestern University in 2004, before going on to receive a master's degree in Public Affairs from the LBJ School of Public Affairs at University of Texas at Austin in 2007. He lives in Silver Spring, Maryland with his wife and two young children. So thank you for joining us and I will turn the program over to them. Thanks, Serena. Uh, yeah, and on the note of uh, two young children, if anyone comes wandering through the room here at the moment, um, that that would be one of those two young children. So please bear with me. It's bedtime around here. So um, yeah, I just thought I'd get it started here, I guess, um, by, uh, you know, just 
letting you all know that um, un unlike our other two panelists here, I, I um, am pretty hyper focused on water issues. So I haven't focused on sustainability as broadly in my career. So I feel like in some ways I, I'm kind of representing uh, everybody else um, on the panel here and, um, you know, just kind of, even though I work on environmental policy, I don't necessarily, um, you know, usually think about big picture um, climate change and global change uh, kind of issues that much in my day-to-day -day work. So um, anyway, it's, I think we all bring sort of different perspectives to the table here, but that's kind of where I am. I have an environmental policy background, um, but I actually don't do that much day-to-day uh, -day on climate change. And so I think that's sort of where I wanted to start with this was um, this book, um, I think just the elephant in the room, as I'm, I'm sure the other panelists would agree, um, it's a book uh, that considering it has the words climate change in the title, um, actually takes a really long time to get around to talking about climate change itself. And it has a really interesting approach um, to the subject matter of climate change. And um, it's different than, you know, what you'd normally get in a book on climate change. And um, you know, she doesn't focus a lot of time on um, arguing the facts of climate change or anything like that. She really takes this more personalized approach where she looks at, um, you know, what she has seen over the course of her life in terms of change. And she focuses on, you know, change writ large um, without necessarily starting with climate change. And I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, it wasn't, like I said, it wasn't what I expected at all. And she does eventually get around to climate change. Uh, but even when she gets there, uh, it's not the central focus of what she's trying to do in this book. Um, like I said, it's in some ways, it's more personal than that. And it's um, definitely about more about sustainability in general. And um, I guess if, if you were in a few places, she distills her message down to this, um, you know, use less and share more. And it's, it's very interesting because she's targeting, um, you know, a very specific segment of the population uh, with this message. Um, she's not really targeting everyone in the entire world. She's really targeting people like us, you know, people in the United States. Um, we're very privileged and, um, you know, consume a lot of resources. And uh, I found that to be fairly effective, um, that hyper personalized message. And it was, you know, different than just trying to convince the reader um, that, you know, climate change exists or talk about how we might solve climate change or something like that. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely interested to hear what the other panelists thought about the approach, whether they thought it was effective. You know, obviously I'm a policy guy, so I see everything in terms of um, public policy for, for better or for worse, because that's what I do on a day-to-day -day basis. I look at policy proposals. I look at ways in which government can, um, you know, potentially um, have a positive influence or positively incentivize people's behaviors. And she really didn't spend a lot of time on that at all. Um, and so as a policy person, I, I really would have liked to have seen um, more of uh, discussion there. She really focuses on putting the onus on individual behavior. And uh, I do think that um, that's definitely part of the solution. Uh, but there are also valid roles for government and for business. And she didn't spend as much time on the solution side of things as she did building up, um, you know, the, the statistics and the statistics were very um, compelling as to what's, you know, happened to our planet over the last 50 years. Um, and there were a lot of things that surprised me, even in some of the areas where, where I do work, I'm supposedly you know, an expert in these areas, things that I hadn't um, heard or really reflected on before. And I thought that was pretty interesting as well. But I don't know, um, for the other panelists, what did you guys think? Was, the, was it a surprising uh, approach 
that um, she took? Were you caught off guard by it? Did you kind of, I didn't read anything about the book coming in. So, um, you know, it, it did catch me a little bit off guard. And, um, you know, I certainly came around to it. I thought it was very well written, um, but it was a, an intriguing approach to the subject matter to say, to say the least. Yeah, so um, Charlie, I'm glad you kind of brought up the, the book from this context. I, I would say that I was, I mean, in your words, a little bit surprised. I, I didn't do any um, investigating into the book other than just kind of reading the, the general summary. Um, but with my job, I'm really focused on uh, climate change and energy. Um, managing sustainability at a global company like Seco, where we have um, products, you know, in, in buildings, automotive, multiple industries from, you know, the roof to below grade um, to your vehicles, you know, we have a big impact. And so, you know, when you think about what can we do for the environment, that's really you know, the goal here. And of course, there's multiple topics from climate change to water to resources. Um, you know, it's, it, there's a lot to cover. And, you know, when you're looking at sustainability. So from my uh, perspective, you know, I think she did introduce it, all these topics that deal with sustainability well. I think there's no question that she knows a lot about all of these topics when you think of sustainability. I mean, I, I really was reminded back of my, my courses, to be honest, at Southwestern. Um, you know, a lot of the activities that we did, um, film, film show, I mean, film, film festivals and things where we, we targeted uh, the food industry and, and um, you know, biodiversity. So she, she really hits kind of all of these um, big topics. And so I see the book as almost like a sustainability for dummies type, type of thing, you know, not in a bad way for dummies, but, you know, like for people who, you know, maybe the target audience is someone who doesn't already, you know, have a very strong, um, you know, maybe opinion on some of these topics. And, and so from that angle, because she does discuss her personal views so thoroughly and so obviously almost, I mean, there's, there's no question kind of her stance on, on a lot of this. Um, you know, I think it's good for someone who just wants to, you know, get a taste into the different topics. Um, I, Ultimately, when I was reading it, I was not a fan of kind of the way she was presenting everything because I found the messaging to be a bit conflicting. Um, you know, on the one hand, it's, it's a personal approach. She's kind of um, coaxing the reader into these topics, very informative, very high level. Um, but then kind of by the end of each chapter, which each chapter was on a different topic from energy to food to, um, you know, poultry and avoiding beef and things like that to biodiversity. Um, at, kind of at the end of every chapter, it ended with a kind of doom and gloom type of kind of a shocking statement. And, and I understand why. I think when you think about the, the audience that she's targeting, you know, people who maybe want to, you know, learn more about what they can do or someone who maybe needs convincing, you know, this type of, um, you know, showing all these statistics, so many shocking statistics, um, you know, it, it can kind of wake someone up. And I, on the one hand, I think that that is, I understand why someone would do that. But on the other hand, I think it can turn turn some people away. And, and so that was how I was reacting throughout the book. Um, however, once I finished and I'm, I'm going back and reflecting on kind of the main messages, I do understand, um, you know, I think a lot of these topics are conflicting topics. So the fact that what she's writing about also comes across as conflicting, you know, 
panic, but don't panic because we need to, you know, be successful. Um, you know, go renewable, but you know, renewable is also a pipe dream. Kind of these. Well, which one is it? Where where does that leave me? Um, you know, it. I'm someone who personally needs to focus on, you know, I, I can make a change and make an impact. And so I'm looking for more of those actions. If it is geared towards the individual, which this book was, as opposed to, um, you know, the public sector or corporations, um, that's fine. But, you know, it, it wasn't till the very end when it was actually topics on on what the individual can do. And, and so, you know, I, I'm, like I said, I kind of find myself conflicted, um, you know, whether I, um, you know, would necessarily recommend, I, no, I, I think it's, I, I would recommend it for someone who needs kind of that full picture um, perspective. But I, I found myself uh, you know, like Charlie kind of mentioned too, and like I mentioned already, you know, wanting to hear more about, I mean, either the climate change kind of was the, what, what it seemed like the book was going to be geared towards or the actions, you know, what can we do? Give me something to, you know, be a little bit optimistic about. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I think ultimately though, the, the title of the book, the, the story of more, or that's something that I kept to remind myself afterwards, you know, while she is proposing, um, you know, we, we move towards renewables and, and we need to, um, you know, be educated on all of these topics, but there's always kind of a, a wrench thrown into all these solutions. There isn't a perfect solution. What I realized she's ultimately saying in these conflicting messages is the solution is to consume less. Stop with this trend to, you know, the story of more because we're never, no matter how much renewable we're able to get into the grid, if we keep going in this trajectory of more and more, more um, you know, we're, we're never going to, to get to where we need to be. So, so that was something that, that helped me, you know, in, in terms of, reminding myself of, of that ultimate message. But um, again, I, I come from the angle of, all right, I, I work at a, a company that is ready to take action. Um, I'm my friend's family. You know, a lot of people I, I work with professionally and, and personally, you know, we want to make an impact. What can we do? And, and that was something that, um, you know, I, I would have liked to have seen more, but um, yeah, that, that's kind of my initial take, so. Yeah, I would agree completely with that, Molly. Um, I had very much a similar reaction to the book in a conflicting viewpoint. Like, do I like the book? Do I not like the book? Would I recommend it? Would I not recommend it? Um, because the book in itself is essentially what I do on a day-to-day -day basis, which is convincing people to green their lives and more sustainable and you know turn their lights off and recycle and eat plant-based and that's what I do is I advocate to the southwestern community to try to make their lives as sustainable as possible on the individual level um, but then as reading the book and she's basically saying everything that I, I recommend on a day-to-day -day basis it just felt a little unrealistic to expect the entire world to just switch and live more sustainably. And then that's the solution to climate change. Um, Cause also in addition to what I do, it's just realizing that climate change is way more vast. And even if everyone just got on board and lived more sustainably, that's still not gonna fix the problem. We've already pumped so much CO2 into the atmosphere that even if we stopped emissions today, we're still gonna be screwed if we don't sequester that carbon back into um, the plants. Um, so I, I would recommend it in the sense of it being a sustainability for dummies. Uh, I agree with that sentence. Like for people who have zero foundational knowledge of what sustainability is, that they have no idea, they've never watched the environmental documentary a day in their life, um, and they get annoyed at their, you know, their eco-friendly friends 
harassing them on why they should be environmentally friendly, this is the book for them um, to really understand the scope of all the environmental problems out there and just basic things that people can do to just be a little bit better. Um, but for people who are actively on the lines trying to do climate action, I just feel like it's not enough. Uh, not trying to sound like doom and gloom, but like climate change is happening now. And as much as I would hope that people can just like turn off the light switch and be eco-friendly, realistically, there needs to be more being done on like the government level and on the company level. Like there's just so much that needs to get done and waiting for individuals to just buy less and consume less. People are selfish, I don't know. It's hard to be hopeful that that's <laughs> the way that will work. We have um, a question that I would like to share with you guys. And one of my favorite lines from the book was, what was only a faint drumbeat as I began to research this book now rings in my head like a mantra, use less and share more. However, she talks about how difficult it is for, um, for us who, for us, I believe she means Americans, to, who consume so much to be able to give up and to share. Can you further talk about that? I think that um, it is going to be a challenge to, you know, this idea to, uh, I don't remember the, um, share more. I mean, I basically consume less, share more, um, you know, almost altruistic idea here. And I'm not saying that it wouldn't solve our problems. I'm just, I, we need to be realistic too. And until individuals are, you know, also willing to actually look and see what they can do within their own lives, um, you know, it's, it's hard to expect that from others. And, and I say that knowing there are individuals, I, I, you know, I would say I'm probably one, but, you know, others too who do make the those chain and it gets frustrating when you don't see everyone sharing those same beliefs and so this is such a topic I when I see that like I'd mentioned that I can't make a difference with something I'm ready to be turned off and and I can't even think about it I mean some of the things happening in the world today it's so depressing and you know it's like I, I know it's out there, but I can't do anything. So I just need to shut off my, my mind to it. There were some of the chapters in this book that I couldn't even read actually on the, um, you know, animals and, and beef and things like that. It's like, I know what's going on, but I just can't. You know, and, and so I think everyone is spoken to or motivated differently. Um, you know, and I, I think the trick here is learning how to get across to a wide variety of people. We need enough action from enough individuals um, in order to actually make a difference. And the, the author did have this one quote um, that I did like. It. She said, it's precisely because no single solution will save us that everything we do matters. Um, and, and from that outlook, just like kind of sharing more, it, I, I think it's a good um, it, it's a good thing to continue to strive for, and pro part of it is probably educating our you know our our family, friends, colleagues on some of these topics. But then, kind of like Veronica said, it's not going to ultimately be enough. We still need to find solutions that are going to make that impact. Um, I mean, when you're looking at how to, you know, lessen your footprint, maybe from a business standpoint, 
Um, I mean, you're, yes, every little bit counts, but you're going to focus on maybe that one operating site or plant that has the biggest footprint to start with because they can make the biggest impact. You're going to start, you're not going to start with the tiny seeds. Of course, things do add up, but we also don't have all the time in the world to, you know, make some impact. And so we do need to be strategic with where we focus our efforts. Yeah. And I mean, I agree that I, I really like the mantra of consume less and share more. Um, I do think though in, in that mantra, there's a little bit of a danger of false equivalency, right? Because consuming less is a lot easier. Um, you know, it's pretty straightforward. We all, we all know the ways that we can consume less. It's pretty easy to, to come up with things on that list. Um, that's individual behavior and that's individual education. And that's what she's getting at in some of the book. But the, the share more side of things is I think a lot more complicated than she gives credit to in the book. And, you know, I mean, she's basically talking about, you know, upending the global supply chain, you know, with the flick of a switch, it's not gonna happen, right? Like. Um, we can, we can decrease our consumption, but we can't individually just, you know, come up with ways to, you know, make sure that the food that we're not throwing away or the energy that we're not using goes to a starving child in Africa or something like that. Um, and I think there's one point in the book where she says, well, you know, we can, we can get a pair of tennis shoes from the other side of the world um, in a couple of days. Don't tell me we can't do this. And, you know, she's got a point, but like, it's not going to be easy. It's going to be extremely difficult and it's totally different than the sort of individually focused behavior she's talking about. She's talking, she's really, you know, talking about broader policy mechanisms, um, broader, you know, macroeconomic sorts of forces that are at play that she doesn't really address at all. Um, so I think there's a lot to unpack there, but she really didn't go there. So I would, I would be interested to know more of her thoughts on it, but I don't think we get them in the book. Yeah, sharing is tricky um, because you always hear like the statistics like, oh, if you don't waste your food, that can help have the ripple effect that some other people can have food, which is great, but people aren't going to purposely try not to waste food if they're not going to see the impact directly. And I think that's where there's a lot of like disconnect. People don't want to do these like sustainable actions because they don't see the return. Um, they don't see the benefit. It's just an inconvenience to them. And so, and that's also with the consuming less, like well, why consume, like I, for me, I love consuming less. Like I, actively avoid trying to go to stores if I don't need to, but other people like things. Um, it's hard because we have built the society where marketing is shoving all these images in your face. Like you need this, you need this new iPhone, you need this uh, new fashion line. And until we can start breaking the stigma that you don't need to buy things, um, aside from the essential items that you do need to survive, uh, consuming less is just gonna be such a hard thing to convince people of when they're already so used to it. And it's just the convenience factor on top of that as well. I'm semi-related to the book, but unrelated uh, in the sense that it's a personal antidote. One of my friends is like this a really huge environmental friend person that I know and he's been tracking his like carbon emissions on an individual level and so he didn't fly didn't drive didn't eat meat barely ate dairy but didn't buy anything new and he calculated his footprint to three metric tons of co2 but then when he put it into the ecologic footprint calculator it still would take if everyone lived like him it would still take 1.1 for everyone to live like him so it's just uh, so mind boggling that even if you do the best and if everyone did the best, it's still not going to be like where we need to be in order to, you know, 
stop <laughs> the impending doom of climate change. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I do appreciate that she she talks to the reader like a mature person at one point when she's talking about climate change, that she basically says that even if we do everything we think we need to do, it still may not be enough. Um, and so, you know, that's, that's good on the one hand, but I also worry that it could push people to an action similar to, you know, some of these other areas where people might just be kind of frozen away from doing anything. Yeah, that was, um, I mean, there were a couple things I, I distinctively kind of didn't agree with. Um, so one of them being, well, in this, this one in particular, I, I can see both sides and, and Veronica touched on it. It was a comment on consuming less. Um, you know, that's not something you can sell. That's not a technology that you're going to go out and, and market and, and whatnot. Um, from kind of this individual standpoint, you know, I, where you're, you're thinking, you know, you and me reading this book, no, we're not going to turn on the TV and, and see commercials like don't buy this. You know, you're not going to really see that. However, I disagree that this, there isn't still, you know, from maybe more of the corporate corporation and, and um, companies standpoint, a, a story there that, that you can um, take advantage of. And, you know, consuming less is within my company. What that means is saving money. You're not spending as much on your electricity or, you know, in, in your natural natural gas or you're not buying as many raw materials to make a product and those are very attractive um, selling points when you're trying to show the sustainability benefits of a certain um, you know proposition if it's um, you know a, a new solution or a new um, product or a new uh, equipment or whatever it is um, you know, typically we're finding that the sustainability benefits do also come with financial benefits as well. And I, so because of that, even from an individual standpoint, I, I mean, I, I could easily convince my parents to, you know, consume less, if anything, to save money on their electricity bills or, you know, someone who might not necessarily have that automatic need to, you know, do something for the environment. Well, Luckily, you can do something for the environment that also saves you money. Um, similarly, with just kind of the, the solutions out there, I think um, we are heading in that direction with sustainability um, becoming a topic that, you know, young people, people are, are asking about. And so with products, with things we're buying, if, if we're able to buy something that replaces our need to buy 10 things or if it's a, a, a product that we're selling that you know you're putting something on your building where you know now the the architect can not put five other uh, materials on the building you're saving resources you're saving money and there's a message there that you can sell so that that was one thing that i think you know we just need to be a little bit creative about this um, as opposed to just kind of this negative um, you know, no one's going to buy into consuming less because there's nothing to sell. Well, that kind of makes it sound like humans are, you know, intrinsically only concerned about one thing. And, and you know, I, I see, again, that argument there. Um, but then the only other thing I was going to mention was um, her, she had said another quote. It was like, um, each one of us must privately ask ourselves when and where we can consume less instead of more for it is unlikely that business and industry will ever ask on our behalf. So I disagree with that wholeheartedly <laughs> um, because, you know, the, my business, all, you know, the, the, the trend, the market is going in that direction. And, and you know, whatever the reason is, if it's to keep up with our competitors or if it's, you know, truly to have a, a, a you know, more impactful, um, you know, reduction in our, our, our footprint, whatever the reason is, we're headed in that direction. Will it be enough? That's, a, that's another question that may be a little bit more depressing to answer, but we're headed in that direction. And so, you know, I wish that she had kind of at least acknowledged that a little bit more. 
I also, that reminds me that, um, you know, this book does seem hyper-focused on the American consumer or, you know, the, the Western consumer, you know, the, that portion of the population that's consuming um, a disproportionately large share of the resources, right? And so she's very focused on convincing us to scale back. Um, but obviously a big part of the problem here is that, you know, the developing world is consuming more. So even if we scale back our consumption, um, you know, there's a ramp up in consumption in other areas. And so it did feel to me at times like she was so focused on, you know, convincing our sort of readership to, to scale back that she doesn't give too much attention to. So how are we going to pull this back in some of these other developing areas where this, that's the majority of the world's population and that's a big problem on the horizon. And I don't know, you know, it, being in the sustainability world, you know, how, how that's viewed exactly. But yeah, Molly, you're right. Like th there do seem to be positive trends to tell about our market, but what about these other markets? And, you know, she doesn't really have as much to say about those areas. Yeah. And, and I, I mean, I think it's a hard topic to try to tackle. So, you know, I'm, I want to be understanding here and from her point of view, like, well, what would I say if I were writing this book is where do you start? But, you know, I, I think at the very least acknowledging those points that, that you just mentioned, Charlie, and, and kind of acknowledging that it, it isn't quite as cut and dry as, as she made it sound. And, and there's a lot of areas um, to be focused on and, and a lot of work that's being done um, already, you know, I, I think that would have kind of sat better with me, but, but it is a, a, you know, of course it's a, it's a hard, <laughs> hard, I guess, thing to solve. I mean, to put it lightly. Yeah. I was, I think one of you mentioned this earlier, but I was a little bit surprised by sort of the, um, the mixed messaging from her, that the, the, the entire tone, the entire trajectory of the book felt, you know, somewhat ominous in terms of the statistics that she railed off. And there wasn't too much discussion on the solution side of things. She talked a lot about solutions that may not work. Um, but then at the end, when she talked about whether she was optimistic or not, she said, yeah, she was absolutely optimistic. And I said, how do you get that out of this book? <laughs> because, the, you know, she doesn't talk about a lot of at least historical evidence um, for, you know, optimism. I mean, we can, we can find other evidence for it. But again, she didn't really go into detail on that front. Yeah, I found most of her solutions in the appendix where it's just like things you can do to advance sustainability, read a book, check your values. And I'm like, okay, great, already doing that. Um, but the climate is still falling apart. Um, uh, yeah, I was definitely hoping, wishful for more, I don't know, tangible, or just like, I don't know, things we can advocate for, things we can vote for. Um, it just feels like, and this goes back to my original statement, like on the individual level, yes, we can do as much as we can and we should, but at this point with <laughs> things going like underwater, it's, there, there's more that needs to be done and has to be done. Otherwise we're not gonna survive. Um, real quick, uh, I wanted to bounce off of a previous point Molly made about uh, business sustainability. Um, one of my like favorite examples is Patagonia. They're like the staple child of like sustainable business. Like they're all about circularity and promoting outdoors. They donate all their profits. Anyways, uh, they had a marketing campaign that literally said, don't buy this jacket um, <laughs> as a way to, you know, promote consuming less and their marketing soared. <laughs> their sales increased um, because they suckered in all the eco-friendly environmentalists who wanted to, you know, not consume, but only consume Patagonia um, products, which I thought was very funny. 
Um, but I mean, you should buy a Patagonia product because it lasts longer than your traditional outdoor wear, but still, <laughs> it's just funny that the message was don't consume and it resulted in more consuming. Yeah, that's funny. Well, so I, I was curious for, for Veronica and Molly, for both of you, since you're in the sustainability world, was there, I mean, was there anything in here that like really surprised you or caused you to think like, oh, I've, I've never thought about this that way. Or, I mean, obviously you, you guys both have done a fair amount of thinking about these kinds of issues and I'm sure in your everyday lives too. But I was, I mean, there were a few things that got my attention, but you know, I would be more of like the layman audience for this. So I was just curious whether there was anything that you found to be really compelling or creative as far as arguments you made. Yeah, um, I know there were a few. I, I need to think back. I mean, I was really just itching to get to the sections on energy, renewable electricity, climate change, climate mitigation, climate sequestration. I mean, those are just interesting topics to me. Um, I, I know there were in, in some of her other um, sections on, you know, the food you eat and, yeah, I mean, the, the biodiversity, the sixth massive, neck, you know, extinction that we're in. And so she had, I, I would say, I, I don't have specific examples from those chapters, but I, for someone thinking about reading it, she does, I think, offer some nice points on all of these different topics to think about. Um, with renewable electricity, I, you know, she offered some statistics on, you know, what it would take. I don't remember exactly, but something like, you know, solar panels across the whole state of, you know, one of the states, I don't remember, Kentucky, whatever it is, in order to meet the current consumption of the U.S. electricity needs needs. And, and so that, you know, thinking of it in those statistics was interesting to be like, okay, so, you know, we're in my job, we're always looking at renewables, but you know, how that can't be the end all be all, you have to actually lower your actual uh, consumption as well. Um, but it sounds like there's also a need to, you know, be creative. We need those, those, you know, technical, out of the box thinkers out there putting together some solution that we haven't thought of yet to, you know, to help us here, because it sounds like, I mean, and, and she did say this, some, like our current, um, the, the renewables, the way they're currently set up, you know, it, it's relying on this as a pipe dream. Um, so if that's true, I, I don't know that I'm convinced of that, but if that's true, then, you know, we need innovation. We need, you know, new ideas, a new way of, of constructing um, a way to meet our needs. Yeah, for me, well, nothing, I don't want to say nothing in the book. Um, most of the stuff in the book wasn't anything new. Um, I had already heard about most of the issues, either through environmental documentaries, other books, studies, just basic, it, it, basic knowledge. But I will say that within the world of sustainability and especially in, you know, the developed country of the U.S., it's very easy to kind of forget about some of the things. Um, I, I had mentioned this to y'all prior, but for the audience at hand, um, I was listening to the audiobook of this during the winter storm. And I was in my car with the like, heat turned on, heated seats, freezing to death because I didn't have electricity, charged, trying to get as much juice to my phone as I possibly could. And I was on the energy chapter. Um, and then I just heard like 1 billion people globally currently live without access to electricity. And I was just like, oh, okay, maybe I shouldn't be complaining right now because I've only been without electricity for five hours. Um, so from that perspective, it did like, put things in a better perspective of like, okay, the US, we are very privileged and we need to recognize that, you know, the things that we have here are not the same that other people have access to. Um, and it's just like, how do we do that on a more, like how do we spread the equity of the resources we're so used to 
to those who don't have it in a way that's sustainable. Because everyone should have access to electricity. Everyone should have access to clean, healthy food. But how do we do that in a way that isn't going to exceed our planetary boundaries? Which she doesn't really cover. In the book. <laughs> Yeah, I thought, I thought it was really surprising, um, and this is obviously just her whole approach in the book. It's like, you know, half a book about sustainability, half, you know, midlife crisis <laughs> in some ways because she's 50 years old and so everything's on this 50-year-old um, timeline. But just talking about, um, you know, what has happened to consumption, not in the last, you know, several hundred years, but what's happened to consumption only in the last... 50 years, you know, was somewhat surprising to me because I'm not used to hearing it spoken about in those terms. And you guys are probably more used to uh, thinking about it that way. Um, but, you know, what does she keep coming back to Switzerland in the 70s or something like that? And, you know, how much more we consume compared to someone there. And if we could just go back to that, how much better things would be. And yeah, I did find that to be pretty interesting because it's something tangible. Like the seventies don't seem so long ago, right? Like that people weren't living in caves in the seventies. Um, they seem to have pretty good lives for the most part. And, um, you know, but in terms of consumption, we're just, you know, eons beyond that. And yeah, it's all just happened in recent history. And I, I thought that was pretty interesting. Yeah, and I mean, it is an, an interesting way to think about it. And like like that example, and like Veronica said, I mean, just this reminder, you know, I tend to be like, okay, I, I do know all these topics already. I am already working on this all day long with my job. You know, I'm doing everything I can. And then I realize, you know, okay, well, when I shut down my work computer and I'm just, you know, in a room, there are little things that I can keep on doing, you know, where you get comfortable and you have your habits and that's where sometimes it's hard to convince people to change their habits because you know people do like you know the what the lives that they've already grown comfortable living um living in and and uh, you know i think that idea of switzerland in the 70s you know it's cutesy but i think it's <laughs> oversimplifying you know we're, we're not gonna sure go backwards, you know, and maybe that's her ultimate point is we need to. And I won't necessarily argue with that, but we're, it's not going to happen. And so, you know, what do we do? And this is just where I'm constantly, you know, like, what do we do? What can we do? And, and, um, you know, I, I think that it's really the, the solution is between the lines. It's in the innovation. It's in, the corporations, the government support and individual action. And this is where she did say, you know, because there isn't a single solution, every single solution is, is paramount. Um, and, you know, I, I agree with that. Um, Charlie, I did want to ask from your, you know, public sector perspective, was there, you know, are any, your, your focus is water. I mean, I, I'm, I know she touched a little bit, you know, with climate change, the, the, sea levels rising. Did she touch on anything that really hits home with, with regard to what you do day to day? Yeah, I mean, she did touch it in her agriculture section of the book. She did touch a little bit on water consumption. And that's definitely, um, you know, a focus of my day to day job, because I think one of the things that most people don't realize is um, how much of our fresh water supply in the U.S. goes toward irrigated agriculture. Um, and that gets toward this whole um, issue of, you know, how much of our grain supply and how much of our water supply are we using to basically raise meat. And, you know, people don't think too much about where their meat comes from, but a lot of their meat comes from the fact that, you know, we use all this fresh water to raise crops that we turn around and then we feed to, um, you know, different um, types of, of meat, but let's just say beef. Uh, and, uh, you know, it, it's not very efficient to say the least. And, um, 
you know, we, we, there's a huge drought going on in the Western U.S. right now. And so there's so much talk about how we don't have enough water in the Western U.S. And it's actually, it's, um, it's, it's, it's not true um, to some extent that we actually do have enough water. But what we don't have is we don't have, you know, the water in all the places that need it. So, um, yeah, I mean, we, we use a tremendous amount of water on our food supply. And I was glad that, you know, she sort of shed the light on that. Um, you know, again, though, as with a lot of her arguments here, um, sort of backing that whole system out is easier said than done. You know, she sort of implies that you could just, uh, you know, if you, if we didn't have the demand for beef, then we could just take all of those crops and we could send them to places where people are starving. Um, and sure, we could do that um, if we had price supports that were, um, you know, in place allowing that to happen. But the fact of the matter is if, um, if we don't have the demand for meat, there's no guarantee that those farmers are going to continue growing those same crops if they're not um, as high of a value as they are right now. So, um, you know, that's just one small example of how this is all very tricky and you can't just, um, you know, take one thing in one place and guarantee that it's going to go somewhere else. And so that's the, you know, this is, these are the higher level sort of like discussions. Okay, well, how do you incentivize this kind of behavior? How do you um, provide price supports for this or that so that maybe we can share more um, and we can make sure that, you know, certain markets don't collapse and we don't get, <laughs> you know, what we're hoping to get out of this in terms of sharing. Um, so, but yeah, I, I, I found that, um, that stuff to be pretty interesting and was, again, you know, not what I was necessarily expecting when I picked up the book in the first place. Yeah, I do wish there was more spent on taxes and subsidies. Like, what are the bad things that really need to be taxed? And what are the good things that really need to be subsidized? Because that's the key of how to get things moving. Like, yes, we can try to convince as many people as possible to get solar on their house and skip a burger a week. But really, it has to, like, from the level of the price like which is going to be more affordable or which is going to have that financial incentive to get things done. Money talks. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, she did. I, I know, I remember she mentioned one thing about a carbon tax, but you said something like, you know, this is never going to happen or something like that. And, and um, <laughs> you know, but I, I agree. I think we do need to, to keep working on this standpoint of looking at these topics with, you know, also the economic, uh, you know, benefit as well, or, you know, if it is an incentive or a tax, but, you know, I, I think that's maybe a depressing point to leave it on money talks, you know, talking about sustainability, but, you know, it's true. And, and oftentimes they do go hand in hand. Um, so that's something you know, to, to not forget, and, and it can be then um, used to, to make the argument more compelling. Yeah, there, I did find her, her whole take um, that, you know, simply communicating information and educating people um, basically should be enough. It, it felt like a little bit naive to me, but again, you know, my slant is that like, well, sometimes, you know, like public policy has to sort of push people in the right direction. Sometimes business has to kind of help people along in the right direction. Uh, but I mean, obviously there's a place for educating the individual as well. Um, I think we'd all agree on that. Well, we're running um, with just a few more minutes left. So I wanted to be able to give our panelists a time to um, leave you with final words before um, before we sign off. So, um, if you guys have any final words you want to leave the audience with, go ahead. Well, I was thinking about you know as maybe one of the questions to the other 
panelists or, you know, just that I was then trying to answer is, well, what is the ultimate action that I would tell people to take or that I would take or, you know, that, that should really be, you know, focused on and, and screamed at, you know, to everyone willing to listen. Um, you know, I, from, because this whole book is from an individual, you know, the individual's perspective, um, you know, the action that an individual can take, I think is not just the simplicity, you know, educate yourself, talk about it, because that's kind of, you know, weak, but, you know, really, when you think about the impact that a massive individuals can have, sure, on, you know, consuming less, that's important, turning off your light switch, things do add up. But, you know, in terms of, of what you buy, or what you, you know, put on your social media, what you support, um, you know, what companies you're willing to interview at, really forcing companies now, because they're not, you know, getting young, bright individuals, you know, wanting to work there because they aren't doing enough with sustainability or with the environment. Um, putting that back on, on your local, um, you know, your local cities or, or your, you know, states or, you know, the government, what, what, whatever route you see that you can take to kind of, you know, make that, those interests heard, I have seen in my field that that does make a difference. So I, I think that is, you know, my little sliver of optimism that I could maybe leave with all of you. Yeah, I would 100% agree, Molly. That was both of which are my, my two cents takeaway uh, piece of advice is to vote. Um, vote at the ballot box and vote with your dollar. Um, it's important that the people in government, whether it's local, state, national, et cetera, you know, we don't have climate deniers in office, first, <laughs> first step. Uh, second step is having people who are actively trying to push legislation to add carbon tax or to have subsidies for renewable, um, trying to make a difference from the governmental scale. And then also voting with your dollar where you put your money is hugely important, especially when you have giant corporations who have certain brands, some ethical, some not. If you put your dollars in the ones that are the more eco-friendly or the more sustainable or the more fair trade, they're going to see that that's where the consumers want and they're going to put more time and money into products that matter and that have an impact. So, Obviously, don't spend money if you don't have to, but when you do, purchase things that are good for yourself, the planet, and for others. That's a great point, both of you. Um, I do think, um, you know, this is a useful book, right? It's a useful book in terms of being sort of one tool in your personal toolkit and sort of understanding maybe some of your personal consumption habits and where they fit into the bigger picture um, of history. Um, and, you know, I think it's an interesting exercise for a regular person to go through, um, you know, to think about um, where they consume and where they might be able to cut back and things like that. But again, like you guys, I come back to there, there are other ways um, to affect things. So in addition to that, um, you know, there are a lot of fascinating areas in this book that she just very briefly touches on and she gives some really interesting statistics on them um, but in addition to sort of the personal behaviors there's a there's some fascinating broader um, political policy discussions going on in any one chapter that you want to take from this book so um, you know it's it's a short book. It's a good read. It's a good introduction to a lot of different areas, but um, I think there's a lot more to dig in. Um, so, you know, if you found any one of these things to be particularly interesting and you want to become more active in that area, you don't, you know, just have to, you know, adjust your own personal behaviors. There's a lot to dig into there um, and a lot to get involved in. Um, and, you know, government is government, but People do pay attention at some point and um, yeah, voting, talking to your reps, all that stuff 
they they are aware of these things. So as a Washington DC person who's been confined to their house for a year, <laughs> I can confirm that uh, they are still paying attention to the constituents. So, um, you know, get out there and make yourself heard. Well, wonderful. Thank you all so much for your participation in uh, the final uh, title in our series. Um, science of sustainability. Um, just because our series is over, the work isn't. So we'll continue uh, continue on. And for anyone who missed the first two, we do have those available on our on-demand streaming page. Um, check them out. They're just as uh, enjoyable as this one was. The conversations just lead themselves and I very much appreciate it. Thank you all for participating tonight. Uh, it's been my pleasure to be a part of it. Thank you. Thanks, Serena. Thank you. Bye-bye.